the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. First, I'd like to welcome His Grace Bishop Karaz. His Grace Bishop Angelus arrived yesterday, we welcomed His Grace. Today, Bishop Karaz joins us, so we welcome His Grace Bishop Karaz, the uh, General Bishop in the uh, Papal Residence or in New Jersey, and the Papal Exarch in North America. We are very glad to have their graces with us. And as I told you yesterday, I tried my best to convince His Grace Bishop Angelus to uh, take the four lectures, but he insisted that I at least do one of them. He wanted me to do two. And I said, they are coming to listen to Your Grace, but he insisted that I do one. So you are entitled to 25% refund of your uh, It's okay. So, uh, your prayers, your graces. The second lecture is about <clears throat> my identity in my culture. We want to talk about the culture. What is culture? I looked up the meaning of the culture and I got the cultivation of bacteria, tissue cells, etc., in an artificial <laughs> medium. <laughs> this is not it. Really, what culture is? Okay, other there are so many definitions for culture, right? But it is the sum of attitudes, customs, and beliefs that distinguishes one group of people from another. Culture is transmitted through language, material objects, ritual institutions, and art from one generation to the next. And when we speak about the identity, what's the identity in my culture? Identity is the fact of being who or what a person or thing is. How can we define ourselves, who we are, in terms of our culture? So, I was thinking, if we are faced with this question, what's your cultural background? What's, what's my culture? What would we answer? How many ways in which we can answer this? Let's, let's listen to you. How many ways can we answer this? I, I'll tell you what I came up with. I, th I thought of five ways. What do you think they are? Who are we? Hmm? Egyptian, that's one. Armenian, we have one Armenian, <laughs> half Armenian, half Egyptian. <laughs> okay, what else? Huh? Coptic, okay, that's two. Hmm? American? <laughs> Canadian. <laughs> Hmm. Middle Eastern, yeah, well, Egyptian slash Middle Eastern. Hmm. Christian, that's four. Hmm. Orthodox. So the five again are not in any specific order Egyptian, American, Coptic, Orthodox, Christian. Okay? These are the five ways. So if you are faced with a decision or a problem or an issue or you want to give an opinion about something, what do you refer to? You refer to yourself or to your beliefs according to being Egyptian, American, Coptic, Orthodox, or Christian. So let's say, for example, if it is according to our Christian faith, where would we go to get the information from? If it's the Christian faith, where would you go? To the Bible, right? And this is what His Grace emphasized yesterday. To go to the Bible, to see what the Bible teaches about this. For example, the issue of same-sex marriage, for example. Let's see. We had this... Uh, a while ago, 
when the Supreme Court allowed uh, same-sex marriage. So, as Christian, how do we formulate our opinion about this? We go to the Bible and see what the Bible teaches about this, right? This is if we are um, referring to our Christian faith or culture. So, if, let's, let's say, Egyptian, the Egyptian culture, where would we go? Where, where would we get our information from? Huh? Yes, exactly. Our parents, we go to our parents, see what they say about this issue, right? Okay, what about if it is Orthodox? Hmm? You go to the church, you go to the fathers, see what St. John Chrysostom said about this issue, uh, what St. Athanasius said about this issue, right? You go to the tradition of the church, the church canons, right? So what about if it is American? Trump. <laughs> Go to Trump. <laughs> mm. You go to Google. You go to the society, see what the society teaches, the media, the friends, right? What if it's Coptic? Hmm? the fathers of the Coptic Church, the history of the Coptic Church, right? So you can see, this is, it depends on what you believe who you are will dictate to us how we make our decision, what's our decision process? How do we make our decisions? How do we plan? How do we solve a problem if we face any problem in our life? Where do we go to? It all depends on what we believe who we are. See, what the problem is, our parents came to this country and obviously they wanted to preserve their culture. Some of them succeeded to preserve the culture and you have many kinds of ways of dealing with this. Some people, they leave their home country and they hate it. So they want to become what the, um, the new place where they settle, they want to acquire the, that culture because they hate their own culture. Okay? There is another kind that love their own culture and they come to the new land and they never miss and they never forget their original culture right and there is another group that while preserving their own culture learn to assimilate into the new culture and this is the best way to do it. Not to lose our culture, to learn the new culture, to assimilate into the new culture while not losing our own culture. So someone, see there's a problem in the second generation. In the second generation they say, studies say that in the second generation there is a loss of identity. So the parents, most probably, they know where they came from. The second generation, they are confused. They don't know if they are Egyptian, and in our case, if they are Egyptian, or if they are American. So there is a kind of confusion, loss of identity. But they say that the third generation, who are most probably your children, they want to go back to their original culture and discover their original culture. 
and they're comfortable with that. So anyway, someone did a study, his name is William Cross, and he said there are five stages, but the final stage is what interests us. He says, the individual has fully integrated his or her ethnic heritage into a single identity. He or she becomes able to be an emissary, someone who can respectfully share his or her uniqueness without crushing the uniqueness of another. So you're comfortable with your own culture while respecting other cultures as well. Um, let me tell you, someone was faced with multiple questions in a crisis, in a situation where he had to give an answer about who he is. And it was in the middle of a very serious problem. And guess what he answered? Do you know who I'm talking about? Jonah. Jonah. You know, he was aboard a ship going west when God asked him to go east. And there was a tempest, and they were all going to die while the prophet was sleeping. They woke him up and said to him, come on, are you sleeping? And then they asked him five questions, five questions. Then they said to him, this is in Jonah chapter 1. They said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? And of what people are you? Right? How many questions did he answer out of the five? He just answered one. This was his answer. So he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. See, you can be faced with a question, who are you? And then you would answer according to what you believe who you are. And it depends on the situation as well. Who do you think you are? Why do you think someone would ask you who you are? I know if someone asks me where I am from, I know they are not expecting me to say from New York, right? Because they ask me this question because they want to know what my background is. This is why they ask. Because I'm not blonde, obviously, and, and uh, you know, my, my, the color of my skin or my hair does not show that I am Native American, right? But they ask because they want to know what my background is. So I obviously answer, I am from Egypt, originally from Egypt. I am Egyptian. I am Coptic Orthodox, according to my faith, right? So if someone asks you, what would your answer be? How many would say I am Egyptian? Or my parents are Egyptian? Or I have Egyptian background? How do you identify yourself according to your culture? What's your culture? Sometimes we hate who we are. Right? We hate it. And I hear this a lot. I hate my culture. And because I hate my culture, sometimes I hate my church. I hate my parents. I don't like to go to church. I don't like to have church friends. 
Maybe not many of you are like that, talking about many who are not in the church anymore because they hate it. But we have to com be comfortable in our own skin. We have to know who I am and to be comfortable with that. To love myself because the Lord said, love your neighbor as yourself. So we are expected to love ourselves, to love who we are. You know, one time I was on the plane and then a lady was next to me and she asked me where I am from. And I answered, so I asked her, what about you? She said, I'm Hebrew. So I thought this was a good chance to talk to her about Christianity. So I always say, you know the only difference between Jewish people, she said, I am Jewish. So I said, you know the only difference between Jewish or Judaism and Christianity is that we believe that Christ came, whereas you still believe he's still coming. So I, I, I said to her, what do you know about your faith? She said, I don't know anything. I'm just proud to be Jewish because we have a good history, because of our history. And that's what made her proud of who she is, her history. What do we know about our history that makes us proud of who we are? You know, we have a problem. We really have a problem. In this generation, we believe that all Christians are one. There is no difference. And when we speak about our orthodoxy, we say, why the Coptic church is so rigid and so biased why, or too strict? Why can't we be flexible and love everybody? Can we love everyone but still know our faith and be proud of who we are or we are all one? and just uh, get together and take a, a nice photo. No, we have to be proud of who we are and understand that the faith that we have to, this Orthodox faith that we share today came to us with the blood of the saints, with the blood of the martyrs. We say that the blood of the martyrs were the seeds of the faith. If it wasn't for their faith for which they shed their blood. We wouldn't have this faith today. So to say we are all one, irrespective of what the saints have done to preserve this faith for us is very dangerous. It's simply because we don't understand. We take things superficially from the outside, not knowing the importance of the preservation of our faith. In order to come to terms with our identity in our culture, I like very much the serenity prayer. I always like to mention it because it says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. To change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Number one, the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. Sometimes we are trying to change the things we cannot change. And by the way, now they can change everything. They can change the hair color. They can change the eye color. Sometimes the skin color. If you want to look blonde, you can look blonde, right? But. Are you comfortable with who you are? Are you happy with who you are? Can you accept who you are? Or this is bothering you? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change about myself, about my culture, about my surrounding. 
Can I change my parents? Can I change my brothers or sisters? Can I change my church? These are things that I cannot change. And the courage to change the things I can change. There are things that I can change to become a better person. And the wisdom to know the difference. In a free country like the United States, we are free to express our beliefs and values and everything else. But why do we want to melt in the melting pot and be like everyone else? I don't like that. Because we are trying to please others. You see, let me ask you this question. If you see a Jewish person, especially the Orthodox Jewish people. You can identify them, right? By the way they look. Men or women, and even children, on Saturday morning, while it's freezing, and there is a snowstorm and a blizzard, and 6 a.m., they are going to uh, the synagogue. I'm amazed when I see that, because I'm taking my car to go to church while they are going to the synagogue walking. They have a tradition. They keep that tradition. And they respect that tradition. But let me ask you this question. If anyone looks at me, can they say this is a Coptic Orthodox? Have we made an identity for ourselves? Do we have an identity? Can people point at us and say, I know this is Coptic Orthodox. I know that sometimes the cross identifies us, right? You know, I was in the uh, airport going to Toronto one time. Someone, one of us on the, in the customs, he said, are you Coptic Orthodox? I said, yes. So he, sh he told me to show him my fist. And I went like that. Thank God I had the, the cross. <laughs> Otherwise, he wouldn't have believed. So this is one thing that identifies us. And I was a bishop at that time, by the way. That's why he's asked this question. But do we have anything that distinguishes us from others? Do we want to be distinguished? Do we want that? I thought about that a lot. Do we want to be distinguished as a nation, as a people? Are we proud of that? Are we proud to be Coptic Orthodox Christians? Are we ready and willing to show that? It has a responsibility as well. We live in a country that we can express our faith and beliefs without being judged, as long as we respect other people's cultures. When our parents came here or in other places, their idea was to preserve our culture and to be part of what they give to their children so that it can be maintained. So what's the cultural identity? Acts as a way to preserve history and provides individuals a place where they feel they belong. Do you feel you belong here? This is where you belong? Or you feel estranged when you come to church? It is established when a group of people continually follows the same sets of social norms and behavior as those of earlier generations. So to have a sense of belonging, I belong to these people. I am part of this. This is where I feel my comfort zone is. I want to leave you with five points. Number one, identify and purify. What does this mean? 
Sometimes we don't like certain aspects about our Egyptian culture. But not everything is Egyptian culture. We have to identify what is Egyptian versus what is Christian. Because our culture has been tainted with other cultures in which we lived for many centuries. So we have to purify our Christian culture from the influence of other cultures. And our parents need to do that as well. Number two, do not try to be something that you are not. Do not try to be something that you are not. Because we will not be that something and we will lose who we really are. I like a verse in the Song of Songs which says, the bride says to the groom, tell me, O oh, you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you made its rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companion? What does this verse mean? Tell me, O oh, you whom I love. Who is that? Jesus himself, our Lord. He is the one whom we love. He is our Savior, as his grace told us yesterday. He is our Redeemer. He is the one that loves us more than a mother loves her nursing baby. He is the one. He is the one whom I love. Where you feed your flock, I want to be a member in your flock. But tell me, well, where do you feed your flock? Where you made it rest at noon when the heat of the sun is so intense, where do you feed your flock? Because I am lost. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? Why should I be going here and there, putting a mask or veiling myself with other flocks that I don't belong with, but I belong to you. Tell me, where do you feed your flock? Because my heart's desire is to be with you. When I go to these places or with these friends, away from you, I think I may have peace and joy, but I found none. I want you, and only you, my beloved one. So tell me, where do you feed your flock? I want to come back to you because I haven't found that peace away from you. Third point, the answer to the second point. Know your way clearly. Know your way. Have a clear vision of who you are. The answer is the next verse. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock. You want to be part of the flock? There are members who walk this path before us, and we just have to follow. This is the culture. We can't change that. This is our tradition. We can't change our faith. We just have to follow after the footsteps of the ones before us. This is orthodoxy. We're not trying to change anything. Find the people who will guide you. Feed your little goats beside the shepherds' tents. God has appointed shepherds in every generation to guide you. There are the shepherds who are the fathers of the church throughout the generations, and there are the shepherds who are the present clergy who will also be able to guide you. So don't try to make up something new. Orthodoxy means to follow after the footsteps of 
our forefathers. Number four, be selective. Be selective because in the dominant culture in which we live, there are good things which we can learn from. I'm not implying that let's reject everything in this culture. No, we are part of this world. As His Grace said yesterday, we live in this world, but we are not of this world. This is what the Lord said. I do not pray in John chapter 17. He said, I do not pray that you take them away from the world, but to keep them from the evil one. Okay? So we are part of the society. We are part of this dominant culture in which we live. But how can I be distinguished as someone who know their identity, have their identity, have their culture, while we still have good relationships with others, respecting their cultures, and they love us for that. So, be selective. Last point, be and feel very special. God created us in His image, in His likeness. And the way we are is the best way for us. So be, feel very special. Because you are very special the way you are. And do not be try something that you are not to please others. So don't try to fit into something that you are not because it doesn't look good. If you're trying to be something that you are not, it doesn't look good. You lose your own identity and you are not going to gain something that you are not because it will be very funny. It's, it's trying. You look, can I bark here? Policeman said to him, you can bark anywhere. So he, he parked, and then he came back, he found the ticket. He said, why did you give me a ticket? <laughs> Man says, why did you give me a ticket? I took permission. I told him, he said, I want to bark, not bark. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is, don't try to be something that you're not. Okay? I want to leave you with a quote from St. John Chrysostom that summarizes this whole lecture. It's very nice. Okay? Ready? He says, I am a Christian. He who answers thus declared everything at once. His country, profession, family. The believer belongs to no city on earth, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. So, if someone asks you, where are you from? This is my country. What do you do? Your profession. What's your family? What's your people? So, St. John Chrysostom is saying, if you say, I am a Christian, then you're really on the mark. Because this is all what we care about. The believer belongs to no city on earth, but to the heavenly Jerusalem. If you know that, blessed are you because you, tr you truly know who you really are. Glory be to God forever. Amen.